Hey there, I'm Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com, and this is Goulet Q&A number 78. It is May 15th of 2015. I had to look at the date because I'm actually shooting this on the 8th. I'm shooting it a little bit early, uh, as if you watched my last week's video, you know that I'm traveling and doing a lot of things right now, so still trying to keep the Q&A going because I know how much a lot of you really love it. Uh, so, and I wanna honor that. So I'm trying to keep it going regularly, so I'm shooting it a week ahead of time. So forgive me for the like lack of timeliness of some of my references and stuff like that, but um, still got some good questions. Ended up having to kind of double up from the previous week and kind of take questions out of there. So I kind of took on a lot of questions that maybe I wouldn't have normally taken. I was just feeling in a very like, you know what, just bring it on kind of mode. So some of them here are kind of specific, a little off, so you, you're not off, no, I don't really know if that's a good term or a bad term, depends on the context, I guess, but just uh, you know, questions that I maybe wouldn't normally answer for one reason or another. So let me know if you like it, we'll see how it goes. So I don't really have any updates because uh, you know, I won't really have known at this point what's going on, but uh, I'm just at this point of the video coming out, I'm just coming back from San Diego from the Entree Leadership Summit event being put on by Dave Ramsey and his team. Lots of leaders there, so it should be a good time. My brain is probably melted by now, but uh, it should be a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, I'll just go ahead and just get right into the questions here. Get right to the content. So um, first group I have is from Pens and Writing. Uh, first question is from William S. on Facebook. All right, since my Noodler's Nib Creeper Rollerball pen has already failed, what is a good replacement? Okay, the Nib Creeper Rollerball has been out for a few years. It's actually a discontinued pen. Noodler's is not gonna be making it anymore because from what I understand, the cost of those Rollerball tips went up so much, it's no longer economical and he's just not interested in carrying that pen anymore. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been a pretty decent pen. It's had some you know, quality issues over the years and stuff like that. Um, you know, it says it's already failed, so I'm really sorry about that. If you got it from us, you know, reach out and we'll we'll make it right for you. But um, you know, the part I'm going to focus on for this question though is the replacement part. So you know, basically, there's really not much else that is a replacement. Jay Bond has a cartridge-only rollerball pen that's okay. It's around ten dollars. It's not my favorite, but it's there. Uh, aside from that pen, you're pretty much going to go up to like a Monteverde One Touch Engage, which is more closer to $100, um, or the Monteverde Ink Ball, which is one that I don't even carry, but uh, it's a it's a really big pen that's also a refillable rollerball. Uh, it looks a little funny and uh, it's not very uh, popular, so we don't actually carry it. Um, but it does write okay, but you know, to buy a replacement tip for this is like, you know, I forget how much it is, but it's at least at least $10 or somewhere in that range because it's basically the whole like grip of the pen that you're buying. Um, and then it's the same kind of thing with the uh, one touch engage. It's, uh, you know, you're buying a whole replacement tip for eight or $10, or something like that. So that's the challenge that you run into is whenever you're dealing with a refillable rollerball, I, I kind of view it as like jack of all trades, master of none. You know what I mean? It's like the concept is really good. Being able to use your fountain pen ink that you want with all the benefits of a rollerball. Well, it also has all the drawbacks of both too. You know, when you are writing with a refillable rollerball, it's, uh, it's not the same writing experience as a fountain pen. It feels much scratchier and it's just, it does not feel as smooth. Uh, no matter, pretty much no matter what you do because it's a, it's a ball. Uh, and then the challenge uh, also is that you are dealing with some of the cleaning and filling issues of a fountain pen. So it's uh, for most people who kind of get into it, they get really excited at first and then end up really not loving it in the long term. So I can't speak for everybody, but uh, there's just the pop popularity of refillable roller balls has declined greatly. Um, you know, when they first started to come out with like the Noodler's Pen and Jerevan and some of these other ones a few years ago, it seemed really exciting and we were all kind of getting on board and then the feedback was not so great. Some of the reviews and stuff, if you look at our site, are just not the best. Um, and so the people have kind of spoken. So it is what it is. So eh, aside from the Nib Creeper Rollerball, I, I just really don't have a great option for you and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, Matthew M. on Facebook, I inherited a Parker 45 desk pen with a marble stand from my grandfather. This is exactly the kind of question I wouldn't normally take. Uh, however, the pen is always dried up after a week or so in the stand. Any suggestions on how to prevent a desk pen from drying out? Okay, so right off the bat, Matthew, I don't have a friggin' clue of what's going on with your 45 
in the marble stand. I don't know what that is. You know, I'm generally familiar with Vintage Parker, but the 45 specifically, I don't know. And the desk set seems kind of neat. That's cool. It's from your grandfather. Very sentimental. That's awesome. Um, how to prevent it from drying out. So there's a one trick that you can do, not just with a desk pen, but any fountain pen, um, is if you've got enough room in the cap, or in this case, the stand, uh, you can actually cut a small piece of sponge and shove it down in there and then wet it. And then when you're putting the pen on there, it's gonna act like a small humidor. So it's gonna keep your pen uh, wet so it won't dry out as much. So it's a kind of a neat little trick. Um, it's one that I've uh, used myself on certain uh, fountain pens that's worked okay. Um, the only thing is you don't wanna cut such a big piece of sponge that the tip of the nib actually touches the sponge when it's in there, because if it does that, that sponge is gonna wick all the ink out of your pen and it's going to actually make your problem worse. So maybe something you experiment with a little bit. I'm not sure if it's something you wanna do on something that's as sentimental as this marble stand that you have from your grandfather. So maybe that's up to you, okay? Um, but other than that, I don't really know what tricks there might be for that kind of situation, especially with a desk pen. You know, you're kind of limited to what it is. So with a fountain pen, you know, you could like carry it in a Ziploc bag or something to help with the drying out problem. You really can't do that with a desk pen. So other than keeping it in a room that's more humidity controlled, maybe, but that's really kind of a stretch. Um, I think it's kind of just is what it is. So uh, I would suggest cleaning the pen more regularly, uh, making sure that the pen is cleaned thoroughly to begin with, because what you might be dealing with, especially a vintage pen, a little bit older, you have no idea how long it's been taken care of, give it a really thorough cleaning with a pen flush and stuff like that, um, so that you can get any old ink buildup out of the pen that might be part of your problem is if you got old crusty junk through the feed system of that pen, it may not be flowing in the first place like it's supposed to. And so maybe it's drying out because there's still junk built up in that pen. Just a speculation, it's something to look into, okay? Um, and the last thing that I would recommend that you could do is you could maybe try a different ink, okay? So maybe try a lubricated ink. Um, Monteverde has what they call ITF technology. I don't know exactly what that stands for, but it's a, it's a type of lubrication and they specifically tout that that ink in a pen will be less likely to dry out quickly. So it might work in this kind of situation. Maybe get some samples, try it out. You know, a lubricated ink like a Noodler's Eel series or maybe maybe a Pilot of Roshizuk or something. I don't know. It's kind of a stretch, but you could, you could always give that a shot too. So those are the recommendations I have for you. But good luck, and that sounds like a really cool thing that you got from your grandfather. I got into fountain pens when I was 25, no family lineage of it whatsoever, uh, but I can guarantee you my kids are going to be inheriting a lot. Um, next question I have is from Deborah P. on Facebook. Do you advise any special care for pens during extremely hot weather? Okay, so I guess as we're coming into summer here, um, I know a lot of us, especially if you're up in the Northeast, the winter is still very strongly in your memory, but uh, you know, other parts of the country is starting to get a lot hotter, other parts of the world maybe. Um, so yes, so the best thing to do is to try to keep them out of the heat in the first place. Okay, so especially if you're bringing them in your car, your car can get unbelievably hot. Like if, I know if you can measure the dashboard of most cars, it gets between 120, 150 degrees. It's amazingly hot. Please try to keep your pens out of that kind of heat if you can. If you have to keep it in there, try to keep it in a case or something where it's not gonna have direct sunlight, that'll help. Um, but uh, they will dry out, so I would say trying to keep them sealed up as well if you can. Um, that's part of where you know keeping them in a case or container might help possibly, um, or maybe a Ziploc bag uh, could help too. I have a Ziploc bag over here that I've got a couple of bottles of ink in. So. Just shot my video on traveling with pens to a work conference. So I'm not sure if that video will have published yet at this point, but uh, look for that one coming soon. Um, so yes, what else? I would say be diligent with cleaning your pen. No, uh, so it won't dry out. So that's another thing is if you are leaving it in a hot environment, the water is gonna be more likely to evaporate out of the ink. The ink is gonna flow quite as well. So just filling the pen more often, cleaning it out is something you're gonna to have to um, probably do more often as to what degree it's gonna depend on the pen. Pens that don't seal very well are gonna be more susceptible to that. Generally with hot in environments, you're dealing with you know, less uh, moisture in the air typically. Here in Virginia, uh, it's kind of the opposite. It gets super you know, moist and uh, humid here in the summertime. 
So we don't really deal with uh, pens drying out nearly as much in the heat of the summer. Um, and then the last thing I uh, had, well, it was keep, some, keep them in some kind of sleeve or case or something like that. That's part of the direct sunlight thing. So the, those are my recommendations. Really just try to keep them out of the heat um, and then keep them clean. That's about it. All right, at uh, Kuklan, I don't know if I said that right on Twitter. Uh, I'm looking, <laughs> forgive me if I butch that. Um, I'm looking for a cursive style to learn with an Ahab. It seems a lot of popular cursive styles need an offset nib. Any ideas? Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Offset nibs, essentially an offset nib is, I'm gonna use two different fountain pens as an example. An offset nib is if you have a pen holder. This is for calligraphy dip pens we're talking about here. Um, you have a pen as such, and you hold it, a pen holder, and then you have this little jut out over on the top that allows your nib to be held in this kind of position. So at a completely different angle than what you would possibly normally hold it when you're writing. And that offset nib is very common for um, certain types of calligraphy with dip pens. Uh, but if you think about how a fountain pen works to try to do an offset fountain pen uh, would be very complicated. And in fact, literally as I'm saying that, I'm wondering if that's ever been done. It would have to be a possibility. There would have to be a way to do that somehow. I'm just curious if anyone has ever tried an offset fountain pen. It's very interesting. If that has happened, let me know. Let me know in the comments. I'm very curious about that. Um, but yes, so in that respect for the offset thing, you're going to be dealing with a fountain pen. It's, it's two completely different deals, right? It's like a truck versus a car. Like, yes, you can do some of the same things with both of them, but they accomplish two very different things. Um, so that said, um, if you're going to go with a fountain pen like the Ahab, you certainly can get a very uh, expressive cursive style with that. A lot of people do that. Um, in fact, if you go to the postmansknock.com, it's just one resource that I had that Madigan, um, our community coordinator here, uh, was a fan of. She sent me um, something called the Caitlin style, um, which is really kind of cool, like modern calligraphy kind of thing that you can totally do with an Ahab. Um, so check that out. I got a link to it on the blog. Um, and so check that out. So there's definitely certain calligraphy styles that you can do with just a fountain pen, especially a flex nib fountain pen. So you've got some options. And the other thing you can do is check out uh, on Fountain Pen Network. Uh, dot com. You can check out. They've got a sub forum there for penmanship. You'll have a lot of options there as well. All right. At Seb Morissette on Twitter said, Brian, from your experience, what's the best $125-ish fountain pen that money can buy plus available nibs for that pen? <laughs> Well, Seb, you are pretty much in limbo in this price range. Uh, reason is when you start to get into the 140-ish dollar range, that's when uh, you start to get into the intro level, level gold nib fountain pens. Um, those are two very big distinctions: is a stainless steel nib versus a gold nib. Um, stainless steel nibs, you'll see a lot of them, and then as you approach $100, they start to get a little more scant. And then between $100 and $140. There are very few. And in fact, if you go to GouletPens.com and you filter your fountain pen search by dollar amount, because you can do that, and then do like a low to high kind of thing, you'll see there's only a couple of pens that are even in that $125 range. It's like the Monteverdi Regatta, and then what else? There's something else right in that range too. Um, so there's you're just you're getting into not a lot of option kind of territory there. So I would say if you've got that kind of budget, you either need to go up a little bit more or go way down. So there's a lot of great stainless steel fountain pens you can get between the fifty and seventy dollar range. Um, I actually just shot a video on my top seven next next level pens, um, which are pens that are right in that lower kind of price range between like forty and a hundred dollars. So I would recommend pushing down and going and checking those out. So check out that video or moving up a little bit and go to a gold nib. Um, you've got some options that aren't that far of a reach from the 125. So if you've got some upper reach, 
you could get into a Pilot E95S, a Pilot Vanishing Point. Um, you know, those are 136, 140 respectively. Uh, Pilot Falcon is right in there too, 144. You got a Lamy 2000 at 156, Pilot Custom 74 at 160. You can see how things can creep up a little bit from there. But those ones are like the sweet spot, like all those pens, I love them. And you can have a really great writing experience with those. So it's it's not that far a reach from 125, so check those out. And as far as available nibs, um, it's, it's too many nib sizes. There's a range of nibs with all of those pens um, that you can check out. So definitely look into that. Go to googlypens.com, check those out. And you can also search uh, filter on the sidebar there. If you go to fountain pens, you can do a sidebar filter by price too that you can um, check out some of those. Now I got some ink questions. One is from David on Facebook. Uh, David asked, is it my imagination or the, do the Diatrementis document inks have the most spread on paper? Can you talk a little bit about inks that spread or don't spread and can you do anything to minimize it? Well, yeah, you're definitely right in that respect. Um, the document inks can spread a little bit and spread basically is just like when the ink hits the paper, it, it absorbs in and kind of goes out a little bit. So it spreads out, that's a pretty self-explanatory term, spreads out from the writing line that you originally drew. So it looks a little broader than what you actually wrote. Okay, that happens. Um, it happens with those inks. It happens with the um, Super 5 inks, especially. It happens with all the Noodler's Polar inks and several of the Noodler's Eternal ones. Um, I think inks with a lot of permanent qualities have a tendency to do that. Not all of them, but a lot of the permanent inks do have tend to spread a bit. Um, and then any fast drying inks too. Um, the, the thing with all of these inks is they are kind of fast drying, um, but specifically like the quick dry or fast dry inks that you can get. Noodler's Bernanke's, Private Reserve fast dries, they tend to be very pfft, absorbent. Um, and that's part of why they dry so fast, is they absorb into the paper and spread out so that it's dry on the surface of the page. So, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. So that said, is there anything that you can actually do about it to minimize it? Um, the type of paper that you use can definitely make a difference. You know, going with a less absorbent paper will cause it to spread less. That's probably the biggest thing that you can change. Well, maybe not the biggest, but that's a big factor that's often overlooked. People often overlook the type of paper they use as far as like spread and stuff like that. Um, the other thing that you can do is, is choose it in a different pen, a different nib size. So going with a finer nib, you're going to have less of a line, it's going to put down a little less ink, and it won't spread quite as bad. Other than that, you can't really do anything about the ink itself to cause it to spread less. It's just, it is what it is. All right. Next question, at GoHarrison on Twitter asked, I purchased a bottle of ink with a cracked lid. Should I pour it to some other container? Does the container need to be airtight? Well, I know you asked this question like a week and a half ago at this point, so hopefully you've already <laughs> figured this out for yourself, but for everybody else maybe, uh, and if you haven't done it yet, uh, definitely get that thing into another container. Um, for one reason, that if you are operating with a cracked lid, if you knock that bottle over or something, it's gonna leak everywhere. So it's not really a you know, great situation to have just for that fact alone. Um, but the other thing with a cracked lid like that is you're gonna get moisture that's going to escape out of that bottle, which is gonna cause the water that's in that ink to evaporate and which will go down, cause you to have a more concentrated dye content in the ink. It's not gonna flow as well. It's not gonna write that great. And it's going to be much darker and more saturated in color. It's gonna be harder to clean and so on. So you really wanna get that taken care of. So get it into a different bottle if you have to. Um, and yeah, the container does definitely need to be airtight for all of those reasons that I just explained. Um, if you need any spare bottles, go to gouletpens.com. It's really not order. It's not worth just placing an order just for that. But the next time you are placing an order, um, you can go ahead and pick up a couple of empty ink wells because we we carry empty bottles because we do ink sampling here and we use full bottles. So we we just you know put them aside and we offer them um, as spare bottles for exactly this kind of situation if you need them uh, for you to be able to decant it into some other bottle. So and you can always upgrade, get something like a Pilot of Rochezuka bottle or a Pelican Edelstein or some nicer looking bottle and you can always decant it into that. There's nothing wrong with that. So um, that would be the option. Um, but the first thing you might want to do is contact the retailer where you bought it. If it was from us, please let us know. We will ship you another one. Um, but any other retailer too, you may want to let them know if it shipped to you and it was cracked, that's a defective product and they really should try to make that right. So maybe I should have said that first at the beginning of the question, but that was, that's the first thing that you really should do is see what the retailer will do to make it right for you. All right, Whew. on a roll. 
Uh, next one, I got some business, well, not some, I have one business question, okay. Uh, this is from Donna M on Facebook. Donna asks, can you please tell your customer about your customers about your very fine special order department? They bent over backwards to get a beautiful cigars for me, Schaefer cigars, uh, for me that was not listed on your site. I'm so thrilled with it and grateful. Um, I think I've talked about this before, but we probably don't push this enough. Um, so if you look at all of the brands that we carry on our site, we can get you, with some rare exception, we can get you the full line of what they offer. We can definitely get you whatever they offer in the US. Um, usually we can't special order things that are only available in other countries. So, um, but uh, I'm, I'm tracking too far in my thought, but let me back up. So anything, any brand that you see on our site, we're, we are authorized retailers of that brand. So um, we can get you whatever you're interested in for the most part. So if you are interested in a color of a pen that we don't normally offer, we can get you that. If you're interested in a model that you know exists, for example, the Cigars is a pen, is a pen that we normally carry, but for example, a Waterman Kareen or a Pelican, M600, we can get you that. We really can. So we, we do special orders for it. We charge what we normally would charge if we had it on our site. Usually it's 20% off list price. Sometimes it's not, depending on what we're kind of like allowed to, you know, sell it for or what it's the going rate or whatever it might be. We might do a little negoche, uh, depending on how complicated it is to get the pen. Um, but our inventory team will take care of that. You know, you can you can email info at gouletpens.com. That's our customer care team. And they will put you in touch with somebody on our inventory team that links up to that particular manufacturer and can help coordinate that special order for you. And the wait time is usually not too bad. It's usually a week or two at the most. Sometimes uh, certain manufacturers were not placing orders as regularly, so it could take a little bit of time, but they usually try and give you a good idea. We're, we're placing orders for all of our uh, brands pretty regularly these days. So usually don't have to wait too long. Um, so def definitely uh, look into that. So that's cool. So Donna, thank you for that little prompt. Um, the one thing I did want to say is that there are sometimes models that we can't get. Um, for example, Pilot is one that definitely has a very extensive offering. A lot of pens are only available in Japan or only available in Europe or whatever. Um, and we can't get them here in the US even by special order. So it never hurts to ask. Go ahead and shoot us an email. Uh, but just realize that there are some brands like Pilot where special orders are not possible. All right. Got one personal question this week. So um, this is from Sam F on Facebook. And Sam asked, said, I've watched every Q&A, but I have a terrible memory, Brian. What's your favorite pen out of your collection that Goulet Pens doesn't carry? Well, that's pretty rad that you've watched every Q&A. That's a lot of time. Like that, I'm starting to think about that, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you've listened to me talk a lot. That's a lot of questions that have been answered in 78 uh, Q&As now. So props to you, man, props to you. Uh, I'm saying man, you could be saying, you could be a lady, I don't know. Sam, sorry, I don't want to offend you either way. Uh, but uh, thank you, Sam, that's super awesome. Um, so anyway, what's the best, uh, my favorite pen out of my collection that I don't carry? I gotta be completely honest, uh, I didn't spend a great deal of time analyzing this too deeply. I have a lot of pens in my collection, I really do. And a lot of them are ones that um, we don't carry partly because um, you know, I, my name is Brian and I have a pen problem. Uh, but part of it, <laughs> part of it too, is also that, uh, a lot of times when we're looking to carry pens, we will, um, you know, order them and I'll play with them before we even carry them. Cause I want to make sure they're good. Um, so I have a lot of different pens that we buy as samples, if you will, so that I can try them out to see if they're pens that we're interested in carrying. So I do have a lot of them, and some of them I love for various reasons, but it might be too expensive, we're not ready. You know, the Waterman Kareen is a good example. We've done special orders for Kareens. A lot of people have asked us about them. The price is a little high, so we're just a little hesitant to pull the trigger on them quite yet. We definitely have toyed with the idea of carrying the Kareen, but that's, that's one of my, I'm not saying that is my favorite pen, but that's definitely up there. Uh, but the one that I think is my favorite is um, it's, it's a little sentimental to me. I won't get into the dirty details, but uh, it was given to me uh, by someone who is um, really uh, well known kind of throughout our company here. Um, I'll keep uh, privacy, um, you know, intact uh, on this one, but it's someone who is near and dear to many of us here. Um, you know, good long-standing customer. And so it was a gift. 
It was a gift to me. So it's a it's a pen that uh, I don't carry. Um, it's a it's a Namiki pen. Uh, so I'll try to zoom in just a little bit here for you. Um, but it is a Namiki uh, Blue Impressions. So it's part of their Custom Impressions series. And I don't know how well you can see that. Hopefully pretty well. I'm um, like creeping over my thing here. But um, I, I can't tell if that's in focus or not, but it's, uh, it's the material. You know, it's definitely like a custom 74 kind of shape, writes beautifully, but uh, it's the material on this is just unbelievable. So it's kind of a flecked material. It's a combination of blue, purple, and black. And even though I'm not the biggest fan of gold trim, I definitely think it works on this pen. I might even like it a little more if it was silver trim, but still. Um, just the material and then the fact, you know, what it means, whoever, who gave it to me, um, that's probably probably my favorite pen that I don't carry. Um, but, you know, it, it's not like a clear front runner above everything else. I had to think through like several pens um, on that one, but I think that one kind of wins out for the moment. All right, and then I'm gonna round it out with some troubleshooting questions. I got a few of these, so I'm taking, taking them on this week. Um, so I got four troubleshooting questions to finish out the Q&A. So, um, Vasilis M on Facebook asked, <clears throat> Give me a second, because this is a long question. I've watched the video showing how the Pilot Con 50 disassembles. However, I've tried doing it myself with rubber gloves on, and the thing won't move a bit. What's up with that? Is this a case like the Metropolitan Nib Removal, which has recently become more difficult to perform, i.e. remove the nib, than what it was some time ago? Have they changed the glue used to keep the different parts together? I'm waiting for a couple of Goulet grips, hoping that they'll give me better leverage. So, yep, okay, here we go. So what I did is I grabbed one off the shelf. I literally went and grabbed a uh, Con 50, which is the piston converter with the agitator in there. And I grabbed literally a couple of Goulet grips, just like what you ordered. And um, it took a bit of work. Um, you're not gonna hear the initial like crack of the glue because I did it before I started the recording. I just wanted to make sure that I, you know, was, you know, gonna be able to do it. Um, but I, I did it and so it's much easier after the first time you do it. So I definitely think there's some kind of glue situation going on. I don't know if it's, you know, your particular one might have had a little more glue on it, or I don't know how they do the glue, if it's completely consistent or whatever. I would think it would be fairly consistent. Um, but essentially, it's still threaded, so I know sometimes like the new, like the newer um, standard international converters that they're doing now are like a push instead of a twist like they used to be. So you used to be able to twist them and unscrew them just like this, uh, but that's not the case with, with some of them anymore. So. That's a little confusing, but um, these ones definitely, that is still the case. Um, it's still threaded here, um, and so you're watching me do it now, so I've just disassembled it. So it definitely can be done. You know, this is the same set of converters that you most likely bought from, so it was not easy though. Like, it definitely took some concerted effort. So I would say, uh, get mad, get, you know, Hulk style on that thing, you know, whatever it is, watch that episode of The Bachelor when it didn't turn out like you wanted it to and you got really mad or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. And just really get into it and you can crack that glue. As soon as you, as soon as you crack that glue, you're gravy from there on out. Uh, Sarah C on Facebook said, my Lamy Safari keeps leaking in its cap. Could my converter be dying? It's a few years old. Uh, yep, that could be the case. It could be dying. Um, that happens, you know, convert, part of the benefit of converters is that they are removable and disposable. So if you need to replace it, you can get another one, stick it on. It's only five bucks instead of having a piston mechanism built into the pen. If there's an issue with that, you're into repairs and custom pieces and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and you know, that's just no fun. So the converter is super convenient for the fact that, yeah, you can throw it out. It's $4.95 to get a new one not the end of the world. So that might be the case. I'll just go ahead and leave that as the kind of baseline caveat situation for this question. But uh, other things that could be doing it. Okay, so there could be a lot of causes for a leak. Um, you know, it could be, you know, a combination of pen and ink. It could be, it's getting shaken around a lot as you're carrying it, depending on how you're carrying it. Um, you know, if you leave it in a hot car, the heat from the car can cause it to leak. You know, um, that there's, there's, 
several different things that could be going on there. Um, it could be the converter, the way it's seated on there, which could be a crack in the pen. It could be the converter itself it is just, you know, over time, the plastic could have worn down. It's just not seating all the way. Um, so I would say that you could definitely um, inspect the converter, take a look at it, see if you see any wear, especially if you see any visible cracks. Um, give that a shot. Um, and if you have any silicone grease handy, okay, some of that clear silicone grease, um, you might be able to put a little bit of that around the end and uh, possibly a little bit on the inside of the converter. It's gonna be kind of tricky to do that though. And actually, you know, as I'm saying it, I'm realizing what a terrible idea that is. Because if you get any silicone grease on the feed in that feed channel, um, it would completely block the flow of your ink. So, you know, the way that these things work is the converter holds the ink and then it seats onto your pen. But if you look inside your pen, you can see there's a little post that sticks out. And you can't really see it on this pen, but other pens, it's a little easier to see. But there's a very tiny slit that's cut in that feed in that post that's sticking out. And that little slit is what the causes the capillary action that draws the ink out of the converter. So if you completely just debunking what I just told you to do for pretend like I never said it, um, if you have silicone grease or anything like that on the converter or the pen or whatever, and it gets in that feed channel, essentially what you've done is just, you know, glued your converter shut. So don't do that. Um, so I was thinking, the, the original logic I was thinking is that if it's worn out, gotten a little loose over time, you could put a little silicone grease to seal it up, fill it, but it's too close to where that feed channel is. I don't think that would be a smart idea. Uh, so basically, if it's not fitting properly anymore, you're going to have to replace it. That's kind of your only solution there. Um, yeah, I think that's all the magical thoughts that I have about that. The only other thing that I would say is if you have a cartridge handy, um, a Lamy cartridge, maybe if you initially got the pen and you just kind of put the cartridge aside, check your box, see if you have a cartridge in there. Um, try that, and if you're still getting a leaking problem with the cartridge, maybe it's not the converter anymore. Maybe there's something else going on. So um, it requires a little bit more investigation on your part, but hopefully I've educated a little bit so that you can uh, know what you're dealing with. All right, um, let's see here. Emily B. Um, another Safari question. All right. Emily B. on Facebook, you asked, I use a Lamy Safari, but the grip is weird and I can't hold it correctly. I tried to use the grip, but when my writing was, but then my writing was scratchy. How can I hold the pen and write without scratchiness? Um, you know, this is just one of those situations where sometimes the Lamy Safari is just not for everyone. The, what happens is you have this kind of triangular grip thing going on here which technically it's not really a triangle because it's only cut on two sides of it. The bottom is still rounded like the rest of it. So I don't know what kind of shape that would actually be, but you know what I mean? Everybody calls it the triangular grip. Um, so it's really made to be held with three fingers. Depending on if you hold with four fingers, like my wife does, she thinks that it's kind of a weird way to hold it or uh, like a weird uh, grip. She likes, she prefers just a round grip. Um, <laughs> We have a couple of our customer care staff who hold pens in some very interesting ways. Some people actually hold their pens like this, you know, and then actually write with a right hand hook handed. You know, I've seen that happen and that creates an interesting uh, experience. So I actually like having a team with a little bit of a diversity of writing styles because back when it was just me, like reviewing products and dealing with things, I would hold my pens the way that I do and other people saying like, oh my gosh, this pen's so scratchy. And I'm like, no, it's not. Like, how could it possibly be scratchy? But then I realized they're holding their pen, you know, upside down and hook handed around like this and trying to write. And I'm like, oh, I could see how that would write weird, you know? So um, I've learned that everybody's got different styles. So um, pens like this, they're made to be written in a very kind of a certain fashion. And, um, you know, uh, part of it could be maybe you just have a scratchy nib. So that really could be it. And it could be maybe you need to get that worked out, um, whether it's, you know, contacting whoever you got it from. If it was us, we'll make it right. Um, if it was somebody else, hopefully they'll make it right. Um, and so that, that could be it. But if you're able to hold it in your, your way you normally would hold it and it feels fine and you hold it the way that it wants you to and it feels scratchy, you may want to just try holding it in some different fashions to see if there is a sweet spot or whatever that it feels good and if you can adapt kind of your writing style to fit that sweet spot, maybe it's something you can work with, maybe not. There are definitely some pens that I hold in a little bit different way 
uh, to, to get it in the sweet spot. Uh, but if it's something that, you know, especially for a pen like this and you're trying to work with it and you're like, this is just isn't how I want to write, it might be time to get rid of the pen because it's, sometimes it's just not for everybody, just quite honestly. All right, last question I have for this week is um, Simduha, forgive me if I said that wrong, M on Facebook. Uh, Hello, Brian, I've been watching videos about the Platinum Cool lately and just thought of a hack. So this should be fun. If we could somehow cover the metal joint between the nib section and barrel from the inside with the cut part, oh, sorry, Platinum Cool, yes. Um, if, okay, let me zoom in a little bit because this, this question's a little complicated. They got a Platinum Cool, okay, this pen right here. It's a demonstrator pen. However, it's not normally eyedropper convertible. So you have these metal threads right here, and those metal threads are going to corrode with prolonged ink exposure. So not a good thing. So I do not recommend eyedropper conversion with this. <coughs> but we think we have a hack here. If we could somehow cover the metal joints between the nib section and barrel from inside with the cut part of the cartridge converter, right here, then probably we could make it into an eyedropper. Please confirm how practical it is to cut out the converter and to layer the metal part. So, this is an interesting concept and might be worth messing around a little bit. I've never heard of anyone trying a hack like this. But essentially what's going on when you have the converter that's installed into the pen, it is sealing up and protecting the feed channel in here where the ink is going to flow from the metal part on the inside of this thread on the grip section. And so theoretically, if you cut this to make the piston part gone, or honestly, you don't even have to cut it. You could actually just unscrew the platinum converter and then you could just pull out the guts and you have essentially an open-ended converter. So you don't have to really go cutting anything, but you could if you want to. Um, then could you convert it to an eyedropper and then go about using the pen? Um, sort of. It's not a surefire solution, okay? So the problem you're still gonna have in doing this is you're still gonna have metal exposed on the rim of this threaded section and then on the threads themselves. However, that said, I'm wondering if you couldn't consider putting an O-ring or something around, maybe a preppy O-ring. Actually, as I'm saying it, I'm really curious if a preppy O-ring would even work. I have a preppy here that has been eyedropper converted. How convenient. Uh, I, I, I'm I like on the fly thinking of this, okay? So you're getting to experience the thought process of Brian Goulet, okay? So here we go. I got a preppy O-ring, so this is the same preppy o-ring that you would buy in a four pack from us. So if I take this and I put this around here, okay, so it's gonna be a little bit too big. So it's a little bit too big to fit on here. We would need something thicker. I don't have uh, an o-ring that would probably work for this exact scenario. So you might have to go to the hardware store or something. But something similar in size to a preppy o-ring that would fit around the converter here and that would block uh, the metal part. So it would fit around the plastic of the converter and be fat enough so that it would hug the walls of the body of the pen. Then it, what it would do is it would seal up around the converter and it would keep these metal threads in the top of that threaded section from getting exposed to the ink. And by golly, I think that would do it. This isn't the O-ring for the job, but as I'm looking at this pen, I think that would work. I really do. So, I don't know, I might have to experiment a little bit more. This is not the week for me to be messing around with hacks like this um, because I'm trying to shoot like five videos so that I can cover for the next two weeks. Uh, but I think that would do it, man, I really do. So that is a really cool suggestion. So thank you so much for sending that. Um, the other thing that you could possibly try instead of using an O-ring um, is using silicone grease. You could just grease the living daylights out of the thing and that might also work. So maybe I'll try that first. But theoretically, I could do it. 
And if you don't want to use a converter, you could always use a cartridge. If you did actually want to cut something, I would cut the cartridge, not the converter. And if you do the converter trick, just unscrew it like that. So really interesting question. You know, this is kind of cool. It's been fun for me to like dive back into taking things apart world again. Um, that's all I have for Q&A this week. A little bit shorter than some of the other ones. How long did we go on this one? Okay, not super short, but you know, short enough. Uh, so here we are. It is uh, the question of the week. So the question of the week for me this week is when you travel, what are your favorite pens to take with you and why? Not related to anything that I talked about here today, but because I'm going to be traveling and going to be gone, um, I'm very curious to know. I'm letting you know what I like to take with me, but I'm very curious to know what it is that you take with you when you travel. What are the important considerations? So that's it for this week. I will be back. After my little trip, I'm going to be in town for some time. So things have been crazy here for the last month or so, but life should restore back to normality here for the most part, whatever that means for around here for my life. But it's been a lot of fun. So hope you enjoyed this Q&A. Uh, if you like this video and you want more like it, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Got a pretty good following on YouTube these days. So that's kind of cool. Um, and you can always comment on YouTube or on the blog if you have any questions for future videos. We'll ask you on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. We're around. You know, we're listening. We're listening. We're engaging. So just ask us wherever you want. That's all for this week. Be sure to check out more of these products I've mentioned on GouletPens.com. Thank you so much for watching and right on.